Hello again. What a lovely day we have. Uh, today we are working on division a little bit more. We're going to be investigating remainders and how do we check a division problem and what happens if we need to round the quotient. Division on a calculator often gives us a decimal result. Sometimes we don't need all of the digits in the decimal. Other times we're interested in the whole number of things left behind and interpreting and finding remainders can be a little bit of a tricky business. So the first thing we want to do is to review what the vocabulary of division is. And you remember the divisor, the dividend, the quotient, right? The divisor, that's the number that is doing the dividing. So what the divisor is doing is it asks how many groups of this size can be made. For example, if you have 15 divided by 5, what you're really saying is how many groups of size 5 can I make out of 15 things? And of course the answer is 3. We already know that the dividend is the amount being divided. And of course the quotient is the result of the division. Many times the quotient is a decimal, but if we leave the quotient as a whole number, then we can often have a remainder. So the remainder talks about how many things are left over after you divide the dividend by the divisor a whole number of times. So let's scroll up here and take a look at an example. Before we even get into the word problems, let's just review how to work long division. So we'd like to use long division to calculate 684 divided by 15. So we have 684, which is the dividend, the amount being divided. The divisor is 15. 15 doesn't go into 6, but 15 does go into 68. 15 goes into 68 four times. So 4 times 15 is 60 and then we subtract. 68 minus 60 leaves us with 8. Bring down the 4. And now we ask ourselves how many times 15 goes into 84. 15 goes into 84 five times, I think. 5 times 15 is 75. And then we subtract, and the result is 9. Whenever we do that subtraction, we should always end up with a result that is less than the divisor. So in this case, the 9 is our remainder. If we had 684 things and we were trying to make groups that had 15 things in each one, we could make 45 of those groups, but then we would also have 9 things left over. If we were trying to write all of this down in a condensed way, we would say 684 divided by 15 is equal to 45, the capital R stands for remainder, so with a remainder of 9. To check the answer, we have to multiply the divisor by the quotient, just like we always did. So we would like to say, what is 45 multiplied by 15? But then we don't want to forget that we had 9 left over from this division, so we add the remainder back in and make sure that we end up with 684. So we take the quotient. We multiply the quotient by the divisor. Add in the remainder. And the result 
should be the number we started with, the dividend. All right, so let's try another one here. We want to create some water gauges. A water gauge is made by connecting a small flexible plastic hose to a U-shaped glass tube. The hose itself is about five inches long. So we have a bunch of hose that happens to be 284 inches long. We would like to make as many water gauges as possible and also find out if there will be any hose left over. So we're gonna take this 284 inches, cut off five inches, cut off another five inches, cut off another five inches, and keep on going until we can't do this anymore. And the sense of repeated subtraction tells us that we, of course, need to divide. So we take the 284, divide by five. Five doesn't go into two, but five goes into 28. Five goes into 28 five times. Five times five is 25, and then we subtract. 28 minus 25 leaves us with 3. Bring down the 4. And now we ask how many times 5 goes into 34. 5 goes into 34 6 times. 6 times 5 is 30. We subtract, and there are 4 left over. All right, so what does this exactly mean? Um, well, let's draw a picture of this. Here's our great big long hose. It was 284 inches long. And what we did was we chopped off this little five inch piece to make one water gauge. And then we chopped off another five inches and then another five inches. And we kept on doing this all the way down. So this first little piece makes one gauge. And this next little piece makes one gauge. And the next piece makes one gauge. So by the time we've gotten done, the 56 talks about the number of gauges that we can create, or at least we can supply with this hose. So we can make 56 gauges. All right, well, what's this for? The four is this last little bit of hose that's left over. So a hose that's 284 inches long can be used to help us create 56 water gauges. And after we get done, four, not four gauges, but four inches of hose will be left over. Now, right about now, you are probably asking me, hey, I have this fancy calculator here. And why am I doing this long division by hand if I have this fancy calculator that will let me divide? And there are a couple of reasons why we did this by hand. One was just to sort of uh, get the sense of how the division happens again and refresh our memory. But quite honestly, most calculators don't do remainders. They won't give you a remainder. They will give you a decimal answer. And the digits in the decimal portion of your answer are not identical to the digits that you use in your remainder. That doesn't mean that the calculator can't help us, though. So let me bring our calculator over here a little bit and scroll up the page as well. So this is the Microsoft calculator. Uh, one of these days I'll get your actual TI-30 calculator in this video, but well, not today. What we were trying to do before was 284 divided by five. Let me bring my calculator back, and we'll see what the calculator says. 284 divided by 5, and that gives us 56.8. So what is that 56.8 telling us? Because we had 4 inches left over, and there's no 4 here at all. So to let the calculator help us with the long division, what we're going to do is pay attention to the whole number. Remember, the remainder is what happens after you divide by the divisor a whole number of times. So set up your long division like you normally would, 284 divided by 5. But now we don't have to do it completely by hand. The calculator tells us the whole number portion is 56. All right, so let's use the calculator to see what would happen. Come on, calculator, move down. 
hang on a second, there we go, if we multiplied 56 by 5, because that's of course what you would do if you were working long division by hand. Whatever you put above that uh, division frame, you would be multiplying by 5 and writing down below, getting ready to subtract it. So 56 times 5 is 280. So let's write that down here. And then we can subtract really quickly and find out that 4 are left over. Or if we need to have the calculator help us subtract, we can do that as well. So the calculator won't calculate remainders directly, but we can use it to help us out. Again, as a check, we would say that 5 times 56, add the remainder back in, which was 4, ought to give us 284, which of course it does. So the next thing is, if the point 8 is not telling us how many inches are left over, what exactly is the point 8 telling us? And you'll remember a while ago we learned how to read decimals uh, properly. So we wouldn't say 56.8, we would say 56 and 8 tenths. So what this is telling us is that the leftover piece of hose is 8 tenths not 8 tenths of an inch because we know we had 4 inches left over but this is 8 tenths of the amount needed to create a water gauge Remember that diagram we had up above? Let's see if we can't find it back here. There we go. Each of these five inches gave us one gauge. This five inches gave us one gauge. That five inches gave us one gauge. By the time we get down to this leftover four inches, it's not enough for one gauge. It's part of what is required for one gauge. And it turns out that four out of the five inches that we need is actually eight tenths. All right. So the leftover piece of hose is 8 tenths of the amount needed to create a water gauge, and that's what the point 8 is trying to tell us. So the big deal here, huge star, is that the decimal portion does not visually match the value in the remainder. To find the remainder, we actually have to do some subtraction. All right, let's try another one here. I'm going to scroll to the next page. We have an attic measuring 1,852 square feet, and we need to insulate it. A roll of insulation covers 40 square feet of attic. How many rolls of insulation have to be purchased? So if we were creating a picture here, we'd have this attic and one roll would cover about that much, and a second roll would cover that much, and the third roll would cover that much, and we would go on like that and cover the attic. So let's let the calculator help us out with the long division. We are taking these 1,852 square feet and dividing by the 40, right? How many pieces of 40 are in 1852? Because each piece of 40, of course, represents one roll of insulation. So let's grab the calculator. 1,852 divided by 40, and this says 46.3. So how many rolls of insulation do we need? Well, sometimes your gut is telling you to round down that you only need 46 rolls, but this wouldn't be exactly right. We are certainly going to need 46 whole rolls but then we need a little bit more. So let's see what happens when we work the long division. 1,852 divided by 40, we know goes in 46 times. Find our calculator, 40 multiplied by 46, 
is equal to 1840. So we will write that down below, 1840, and subtract, and see that we have a remainder of 12. So if we purchased 46 whole rolls of insulation, we would have 12 square feet of attic space left over. Remember, we were dividing up this attic space and right, covering it up with these rolls of insulation. And here's our teeny tiny corner that didn't get covered. So what we really have to do is cover the whole attic, which means we have to purchase 47 rolls of insulation. You certainly couldn't purchase 0.3 rolls of insulation, and 46 is not going to be enough. 46 of those complete rolls get used, along with 12 square feet from the very last roll. All right, so one more time, let's go back and look at the calculator display, which told us 46.3. What does that really mean? It means we're going to use 46 whole rolls All right, that's 46.3. I'm going to space this out just so we can see it a little bit. Change my colors here. Remember when we were reading decimals, we read the decimal point as and. And of course, this 3 is 3 tenths of the next rule. So the point three does not talk about square feet left over or square feet on a roll. It talks about three tenths of the next roll that we need to use. Let's move on to the next topic and talk about times when we might need to round the answer to a division problem. Because division, of course, doesn't always give us nice quotients that either have a small number of decimal places or whole numbers. Oftentimes the calculator display is quite long and the calculator won't even hold all of the decimals in the answer. And then we have to round. So for example, we have a repair truck traveling 127 miles using 5.7 gallons of gas. Not the greatest gas mileage, but not too bad either. Let's calculate it. What is the fuel economy of this truck, right? We would like miles per gallon. We've already talked about units involving the word per, so we know that we need to take these 127 miles and divide by the 5.7 gallons of gas. All right, grab our handy dandy calculator here. 127 miles divided by the 5.7 gallons of gas. And wow, that's a lot of decimal places. We certainly don't want to write all of those down, and many of those wouldn't even be relevant to us anyway. Our directions say we should round to the nearest tenth. So if I look right here is my tenths place, there's a two. Looking to the right, I see that I have an eight, which is going to bump my two up one. So the calculator display gave us something like 2.2, sorry, 22.2, .2, let me fix that, 22.280. Seven zero one seven five stuff, but we already know how to round to the nearest tenth. All right, we find the tenths place, and then we look to the right, and of course the eight is going to cause the two to bump up by three, so this truck gets about twenty two point three, and these are miles per gallon, because of course that's the way we divided. All right, let's try another here. Seven identical air conditioners are running on one circuit. We need to troubleshoot the circuit, and we know that when all of them are running, they should be drawing a current of 12.8 amps. So we want to check and make sure that each air conditioner is getting the right amount of current. All right, so we have 12.8 amps divided by these seven air conditioners. I'll just use AC for air conditioner for right now. Again, we'll use our calculator. 
12.8 divided by 7. And that doesn't come out very nice at all. Um, what do we care about in terms of amperage? A lot of times amperage is given, us, given to us all the way down to the thousandth place. So we went to round to the nearest thousandth. That would be the third decimal place. 8 to 8 is in the third decimal place. We look to the right, we see a 5, so we know that the digit 8 in the thousandths place is now going to become a 9. So here, just to keep our notes nice and clean, we'll write down about what the calculator told us, 1.828571429, stuff, 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 stuff. Right. And of course, the nearest thousandth, we pick the thousandths place out. We look here at the five and decide that this eight in the thousandths place should bump up by one. And our answer becomes 1.829. And of course, these are amps. All right, one more. How much will the temperature of a 50 pound block of aluminum rise if it absorbs 6,000 BTUs of heat? We use a table to find out that the, spe that the specific heat of aluminum is 0 0.22 BTUs per pound per degree Fahrenheit. And our job is to round to the nearest whole degree. Specific heat is important to us because the amount of heat that's required to change the temperatures of different substances is what we use to size equipment. So we have an equation here that the amount of heat absorbed is equal to the weight times the specific heat times the change in temperature. And we're just going to fill in everything that we know. So the amount of heat absorbed is 6,000 BTU. And we notice in our specific heat coefficient, we've got some BTUs here. We have a 50 pound weight, so we'll put 50 in the weight slot, multiplied by the specific heat, which was 0 0.22, and then we multiply by the change in temperature, and I'm going to call that C. So C is equal to the change in temperature. All right, so use your calculator, 50 times 0 0.22, and we see that that is 11. So now our equation looks more like 6,000 is equal to 11 times C. And we know how to find C because we've studied the multiplication and division principles of equality. We know that we can multiply and divide both sides of an equation by the same amount and still end up with something that is true and balanced. So to undo the multiplication by 11, we will divide by 11. And of course, what we do on the right-hand side of the equation, we have to do on the left-hand side of the equation. So 11 divided by 11 equals 1. And C is now left all by itself. 6,000 divided by 11, I don't know what that is. Let's check our calculator. 6,000 divided by 11 is equal to. All right, yeah, that's a lot. Nice repeating 4545 five pattern, but I don't want to write all of that out. And besides that, it asks us to round to the nearest whole degree. So the first thing we're going to do is change that C equals to a C is approximately. And then we're going to look at the nearest whole degree. And that talks about the ones place, the whole number. So the digit we need here is 5. And then we look to the right at this 4 and decide whether or not the 5 is going to change. So let's write that out. 545.45, whoops, hang on, get rid of that, 0.45, 45, stuff, stuff, stuff. So we look here, whole degree talks about the ones place, underline it, check the digit to the right. This four isn't large enough to make the digit in the ones place bump up at all. So the temperature of this aluminum block is raised, is raised by about 545. 545 what? Well, it's temperature. In this case, it happens to be degrees Fahrenheit because that's, the, that's what's included on the specific heat, uh, the units for our specific heat. 
Other times we would use uh, degrees Celsius. It just depends on which table for specific heat that you are consulting. Okay, and that's about it for today. So rounding and interpreting remainders. Good luck with your homework, and uh, we'll be talking to you soon. Have a great day. Bye-bye.